Welcome to the Stefan Levera podcast focused on Bitcoin and Austrian economics. Today, I'm joined by Elena Vernova, the head of strategy from CASA. And we talk about privacy, the implications for individuals and businesses who are working within Bitcoin. But first, let me introduce the show sponsors. So Kraken, over my years in Bitcoin, I've been impressed with the way Kraken operate. They have a very strong focus on security and acting ethically in the space under Jesse Powell's principled leadership. They're one of the longest standing Bitcoin exchanges. They are consistently rated the best with a high quality platform. They offer some of the best liquidity in the, in the industry. They've got high trading volume and low fees with no minimum or hidden fees. Kraken have 24-7 support, and on the institutional and business solutions side, they're very popular with institutions too, ranging from funds and asset management to trading firms to crypto businesses. They offer the highest available API rates limits, and there's a Kraken OTC desk. Kraken offer five fiat currencies and also offer margin and futures trading. So to learn more and sign up, go to the Kraken link in the show notes. Secondly, have you looked into Unchained Capital? They are a Bitcoin financial services company and they offer a two of three multi-signature vault product where you can use Trezor or Ledger wallets and you still maintain control with your two keys and reduce a single point of failure risk. So multi-signature helps protect you against that proverbial $5 wrench attack as you can distribute your keys. I've set up a vault with Unchained. I found it super simple and easy. Don't forget, if you create an Unchained vault, you also get three free months of access to Safe Dinamoose's Bitcoin Standard Research Bulletin. And Unchained also offer Bitcoin collateralized loans. You can get USD liquidity without selling your Bitcoins. And this can also mean you don't trigger a capital gains event. So this might be more tax efficient for a hodler. You can keep hodling rather than selling Bitcoins. While that loan is outstanding, it's actually stored in a dedicated multi-sig address under collaborative custody. So Unchained would hold one of the three keys, you would hold a second, and Unchained's independent third-party key agent would hold the third key. To learn more and sign up, go to the Unchained Capital link in the show notes. Now, with that said, on to the interview with Elena. Elena, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I've seen you've been really campaigning hard on the whole privacy aspect. And obviously, we have a lot of reason to be concerned. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about some of the privacy campaigning you've been doing? Uh, so we launched and I, I started a uh, hashtag my data, my life, because uh, we think we we should be rebuilding uh, the way we live online and we should be rebuilding our systems and that there's not enough awareness of what is currently going on on, on the privacy field among, uh, you know, our usual use internet users such as my mom, right? And um, we uh, at, at CASA uh, are extremely privacy focused uh, and we're trying to establish new um, not just like systems and new approaches, but uh, also a new, um, let's say, standard uh, or help other companies uh, adopt a new standard and how they treat uh, clients' cus- uh, clients' data and their privacy. Excellent. And now let's get a little bit deeper into why why is this becoming more and more of a thing and why are people not caring about it? Is it complacency? It is uh, the free services, you know, that uh, that created products of, out of our, uh, ourselves. Uh, whatever, you know, is free, uh, then, you know, you are the product. And it is very comfortable. It is very uh, nice to have all this free uh, internet. And there is a kind of uh, this common notion that, that internet should be free, uh, which is uh, another completely different topic. We should, we should not dive too much into that, but um, but it's uh, it's basically a, a trade off. And you know, until recently, it's not been that much of a of a, an actual problem. It's been a, a problem for individuals when you know they got pounded and and all of their accounts emptied or they found themselves in a, a difficult situation having some loans that they never signed. Uh, but these things happen kind of rarely compared to the, the mass and and that's why people would often say like, well, I'm not a bad person. I have nothing to hide. So I don't really care. 
Now that situation is changing rapidly uh, with new technologies uh, that that we see coming up with uh, our AI uh, that is you know uh, crunching huge data amounts um, uh, real real time and with the five G technology that is able to transmit uh, those data real quick. Um, and uh, again, have you know uh, this AI evaluate uh, what's going on uh, real time. When you see at how strong the five G lobby is, there's almost like zero hope for <laughs> for people not to uh, like uh, for us to to prevent that from happening. Uh, I mean, private companies and governments they are cheering for for the five G, and in fact, it can have very a lot of positive, you know, effects on our lives. Like uh, the science can move forward, the health system, the way we treat, uh, you know, uh, our bodies and our minds. Yes, I'm I'm a huge fan of that. At the same time, um, those tools are weapons, and we must be very aware of the consequences. And I don't even have to come up with some fiction <laughs> to to illustrate that. Just look at Hong Kong and what's happening in, in Hong Kong um, in the past uh, past weeks, where people have, are are completely aware of what the Chinese government is doing, and they go to protest against the extradition law, and they find ways how to protect their privacy because they know they would run into problems. They already had this experience with, uh, with their umbrella revolution. And now they uh, kind of uh, stop using the octopus card. They are deleting uh, Chinese apps on their phones. They're getting new phones. They're getting new prepaid SIM cards. They're putting masks and goggles. So they avoid the surveillance uh, through the public cameras. Uh, and, you know, this is how, how citizens can still protect themselves. Now, why is um, why is uh, you know China a problem and not just China, but uh, the entire combination of uh, facial recognition, survival, uh, surveillance technology, um, uh, even things such as DNA sampling uh, and creating huge databases of DNA. Uh, which, by the way, Chinese are supposed to have the the largest uh, DNA database on this planet, including human uh, DNA. Um, they work uh, very focused towards a goal uh, to collect and to have the knowledge of everything that's happening globally. And whoever has the knowledge has the complete power, right? And so... When you look uh, uh, to, to China, they have a huge governmental program, uh, which ha- is supposed to have almost well, roughly two to four billion dollars uh, that uh, fin- that that gives loans to other governments that allow them to purchase surveillance technology, surveillance software, and even get training from the Chinese government on how to use that uh, to track their citizens. Now, uh, Chinese are su- supplying the hardware, the cameras, right? The software and the know-how. I'm sure they're packaging a nice backdoor uh, here and there uh, to, to collect all the data. And com- uh, countries like, like Germany, it's a huge country, European, strong European economy, uh, Ecuador, and a lot of, there's a huge list of countries that already have that in place. So what is happening now for the citizens of all countries is, is a, this crazy dystopian reality, you know, where we can have huge benefits, but, uh, but the threats, uh, are are incredible and where it can go we can just again look back to china and see how they use the data uh to to stifle and to manage uh the opinion of citizens and and uh, basically directing where where the society goes um they have this social credit scoring right so once you have 
once you have all the data, you know what you're buying, where you, uh, who you're meeting, uh, you know what what's your likes and dislikes, what's your opinions. So they're getting inside your head. Now the facial recognition on the street is becoming extremely precise and sensitive, so they can even see whether you're in uh, distress, whether you're uh, you have high blood pressure, uh, whether you know you have some maybe. Um, criminal thoughts i don't know if they will eventually be able to to do this but but the 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 point being here uh that is not healthy that is not healthy if it if it is in the hands of uh of a government um that does not care about you know human rights and liberties and that just cares about complete control and it's we're on the verge uh of of is this going to go the good way or the bad way. And let's hope we can build systems that help us out. Right. But um, that's maybe, that's maybe a little bit um, uh, too far ahead. So, yeah. Let's hope so. Uh, And I think one interesting thing here is it's not just about the intellectually understanding why that's a risk. It's also about a, a certain emotional connection that people have. So a quick example, I have some, friends who are Chinese here in Australia. And sometimes when they talk of their Chinese friends back in China, some of their parents think of the government as, oh, the government is on my side. I want the government to have these powers. Uh, how can you How can you communicate the risk there? Well, the government's on your side uh, as, as long as you're a nice citizen and as long as you behave according to some norms that they are, that, that are expected, right? Uh, once you start, for example, social posts uh, that you're not happy with uh, with their decisions, and if you have a big followership, you know they start to use this social crediting system to to have your friends police you. Okay, so uh, for example, if we are befriended or uh, through WeChat, right? And I I am uh, sharing all these Hong Kong protests, right? What happens is my social credit goes down, but so does yours, right? So you come back to me and say, look, Alena, I I have to unfriend you because I need, you know, we're expecting baby or whatever, and we need to get a loan and I will never get a loan if, uh, if my score is too low and if I'm associated with this kind of people. That is very scary and that should not be happening, right? Uh, another thing is what, what, several countries do but uh, china is a, is a master in this is uh creating these concentration camps that nobody talks about uh they there is a huge muslim community in the north of china the uyghurs and uh, well they're not fitting in the chinese uh ideal right china needs everyone to behave in a uniform way be a nice citizen behave listen to uh and and auto auto censor uh you know self censor self censor uh so that you know you're not sticking your head above the crowd um you uyghurs uh in northern china it's like a it's a, it's a humanitarian disaster what's happening there and it's a place where chinese were testing all these surveillance uh uh technologies well, and as a result they created a, a a concentration camp where uh supposedly over 1 million uyghurs are now what they're trying to do is a cultural genocide right so they they basically couple Uyghur, Uyghur men with Mandarin women. Once they have a child, the child goes to a specific school where they get, get brainwashed uh, and they are like good, good citizens of People's Republic of China. Now, we're uh, circling around Chinese all the time, but it is very important to realize that all this technology is being implemented all around the world by, by most of the governments. I'll let that sink in. Okay. Um, so, and we want some freedom. <laughs> we don't want this. So we need to really, really build um, encryption uh, by default systems. We need to build new resilient systems. And Bitcoin is just amazing because Bitcoin can help uh, a lot of these people uh, circumvent, you know, uh, this surveillance, circumvent the the restrictions, um, 
you know, if you're not a pleasant uh, person, uh, if you're too intelligent and too loud and you have your opinions, well, the first thing to do is to close your bank accounts and prevent you from transacting with the world, prevent you from earning money, absolutely destabilize your private life. Um, so it, it was an amazing experience. I, I just re returned from Oslo recently, from the Oslo Freedom Forum. Um, and I want to once more thank to Human Rights Foundation for inviting me and a few other Bitcoiners, because there we met so many, so many groups of people from so many different countries that struggle uh, with uh, with these issues. And when they heard, they, many of them heard about Bitcoin for the first time. They had no idea. They were coming up to me afterwards with huge eyes uh, saying, oh my God, I had no idea. This is extremely helpful. How can we use it? Right. Um, yes, so I was I was very happy uh, Bitcoin is one of the one of the tools that can help, but just really, really one of them. Even if, let's say, you're a very private person and you don't have a Facebook account, you can still get leaked. Your data can still be leaked by your friends who tag you in things, or your friends who post a picture of you, and it might be enough such that. Yep. The government or whoever is trying to do this stuff can still create or construct some sort of social graph and figure out who's friends with who. So it's almost like you need to get enough people to take this seriously and not just kind of the fringe 2% because they will still just get caught by the standard, mm. you know, social media. Yes. That, yeah, that's right. And, and like there's, I would love to see my, for example, my uh, complete personal picture online what's out there. I think yeah. if we saw that, it would creep us out. <laughs> and, uh, real, realizing that that some companies may know more about yourself than than you do. Because your memories, you know, uh, fading away, you don't remember uh, who you emailed with a couple of years ago, but Google does. <laughs> they have all the data, they have all your, right, all the way back, and they have machines that are crunching the numbers. Uh, so, and, and with uh, implementation and, and yeah. like, um, uh, evolution of, uh, AI, we will find ourselves to be, uh, knowing less about ourselves than the machines. And then that's, uh, you know, <laughs> no, that's an inter definitely an interesting place to be. And, um, uh, definitely interesting to follow where that's going to take us. Yeah, that brings to mind an example I remember. And this isn't even that recent. I, this is a while ago. I think it was like one of the first few examples of things like data analytics being run by companies. I can't remember if it was Target or some similar company where essentially the company started running analytics and they found an example where this teenage girl, uh, they found out she was basically pregnant before the father of that girl even found out because of the analytics yep. and the b purchasing yes. behaviors. Yes. So <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a scary time. It is a scary time. And it, it's also scary that a lot of these systems are just human created and human dependent, right? Uh, now, is it good or bad? It's definitely good because you cannot write a perpetually good code that will uh, auto deduct, it, you know, auto deduct, auto, auto uh, correct itself. So you need human intervention, but then you have, you know, for example, all these social engineering uh, at, uh, attacks that are actually not that difficult to 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 do and so a huge you know re just recently in bitcoin there was a huge sim swap uh, wave uh, a lot of uh, crypto folks have lost money and it's basically just picking up the phone and calling <laughs> an operator uh, and convincing be, be convincing enough to just uh, swap the sim card to to port the sim number to, to port the phone number to a new sim card and so you have you know network attacks and social attacks Basically, and we need to figure out uh, uh, some help for both, 
So yeah. for the network attacks, we need to rebuild the system. We need uh, more resilient systems. Uh, yeah. We need to get back from the mainframe cloud computing uh, to home computing. And I just recently gave a talk in Berlin about that. And Jeremy was talking, uh, Jeremy Welch from Casa was also talking about this, that we're basically going through several waves of, of we've gone through several waves of computing, right? Starting in the 60s with, with the huge IBMs, you know, in one room, uh, running uh, local apps and local computers. And then uh, we switch to personal uh, computing uh, with Apple and, and uh, Microsoft uh, running, uh, again, local apps. And right now we switch to cloud computing, to mainframe uh, computing that runs all these uh, network apps. And that's a problem because it's a huge honeypot of data. It's managed by people. Uh, it's like, a, you know... There's so many potential attack vectors in the system. And what Bitcoin brought to us, and I started my talk with like beyond the price hype, is an actual computing revolution. Uh, what, what Bitcoin is showing us that how we can treat the risk um, and, and the system on, uh, in a decentralized way and, and basically distribute the risk to the end nodes where it's not that uh, beneficial for, for an attacker to target at all because the, the, the risk reward is much, much smaller than att- trying to attack some servers. Um, and so this is, this is something that we are focusing on at, at CASA uh, to basically help building a new type of home computing where you can take back your ownership, take back your data, take back the ownership of your, of your online cyber, cyberspace life, you know, that you, that you're having. Um, this and key management, which is a, a crucial component is basically the two main pillars of what we do at CASA right now. So, Alina, with the idea of the computing revolution, I suppose there's a few things there. So, with Bitcoin, we typically speak of it. It's funny because it's like we typically speak of Bitcoin as like a a verification machine rather than a calculation or computation machine. And we're typically, when we think of like world computer, right, that's more of like an Ethereum idea, right? And then I think another thing is just around one challenge that people will face with this is sometimes they want the fancy features because obviously the convenience right they want the crazy machine learning photograph processing of google or they want the that kind of natural language processing available in these big servers and so maybe that's part of the challenge is finding ways that people can get something similar to that or like only at a slight degradation in the quality but done locally is that a fair sort of idea that you would think of that's a great idea but how to achieve that right (laughs) Um, yeah or people just have to be comfortable giving up some of those things that they are currently reliant on say google or dropbox (laughs) or whoever for um so one of the things that we can uh focus on is uh our uh, digital identity right and and uh encrypt it have it start locally and use some kind of selective disclosure uh, to uh, to use it very selectively and very lim- in a very limited uh, scope. Uh, so instead of you know uh, signing up to a uh, to a Bitcoin exchange and submitting all your IDs and and proof of home address, instead of that, just like really focus on limiting the amount of data that, that the companies uh, collect and need and uh, in order to be able still to provide the service or in case of you know mass uh, mass computing on, on or using a lot of data just just figure out ways how to anonymize the data um, and still use them for scientific purposes. I don't want to be the person to call, like, let's go back to trees uh, and let's forget all the computers and uh, switch off the the Wi-Fi. Uh, But at the same time, you know, there must be balance and there must be a rather an uh, opt-in solution saying, oh, do you want to participate? Do do you mind, uh, you know, if we use this data? And you say, well, I do mind. No, thank you. I will keep my privacy as it is. Um, we need to establish, you know, uh, easier ways, even for companies to do this. Uh, they, they are struggling and some com- companies will struggle a lot, uh, especially companies that are uh, based on ad tech. 
um, collecting all the data and now to kind of remodel their approach. Uh, it's, it's, it's almost like a mission impossible. You know, uh, how mm. do you ask Google or Facebook to stop uh, using data and selling it <laughs> to advertisers and, and recreate their models, right? I'm, I'm definitely interested in, in seeing what Facebook's going to do with their coin um, and whether they're going to like approach this particular topic. But uh, knowing how Facebook was behaving uh, in the past, I rather think of Facebook coin or however they call it as a surveillance coin, right? There's something that when you couple like owning all this huge amount of data, personal information with uh, a financial tool, the super controlled money flows, yeah, you have, you have it all. And it's like on one side we have uh, Tencent and, and WeChat in China, and I think Facebook will try to to uh, replicate the success of of that surveillance machine. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, especially with things like um, governments trying to move away from the ability for people to use cash, high level or large cash transactions being banned in certain countries, whether that's India or even mm. Australia. That's definitely all pushing towards this idea of the cashless yeah. well, society. Uh, cashless society, in other words, using digital money. I don't see, I don't see this as a as a problem. Uh, but but uh, it's important to to see who, what kind of digital money are you using and who issued it, uh, who controls the issuance and who controls the flows. Okay, so Bitcoin is not cash per se. It's not. Paper. Some call it the digital cash, but uh, because it's it has some properties, right? Uh, but it, in fact, it's a digital form of payment. Okay, uh, so this is one thing I was trying even in Oslo to 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 explain. Like I'm not per se against cashless. What I am against is uh, is cashless society that is created to surveil uh, people and to have complete control over the, the monetary flows, the financial flows. Part of it is also the difficulty because I, as I, the way I view it, it's sort of like banks would probably not, I mean, look, there's two different ways to think about it. Obviously banks in some sense are being deputized by the state, right? AML, uh, sanctions laws, CRS, FATCA laws, all of these laws are kind of, they push them onto banks and then bank compliance departments have to set up the systems to surveil you and, okay, ask you, okay, show me the ID, who is the person you're sending this money to and so on. It's almost like there's just not necessarily a way that you can participate in the standard banking license regime and not take all of these details. You know, uh, my friend uh, was uh, was joking, but he he was actually right uh, that the the banking license is actually licensed to launder money. <laughs> um, and, and, uh, yes, w- without a banking license, you cannot do money transmission. And what what what's happening in reality that uh, all this KYC AML is is basically just burdening the entire system with a huge amount of of uh of work um spending hundreds of millions in implementing all these uh systems uh blanket surveilling the average user so people who are not trying to you know uh do any any criminal activities and and they're just normal people uh so they've been uh they are being surveilled uh, data is collected on them. No bank and no private company, not even governments can protect their server houses. So you have, for example, in case of a Bitcoin bank, such as Coinbase, you have 30 million user data with home addresses with their uh, with the transaction histories and everything in one place. So should that, I hope not, but should that be leaked and, and, and stolen, you have a great list to target people. So KYC is actually very dangerous. And so it was designed to prevent uh, banks from money laundering. But the reality, when you look at Deutsche Bank, <laughs> when you look at Danske Bank, uh, just Danske Bank, one little tiny office somewhere in the Baltics, laundered $230 billion. That's a mind-blowing number. So, so you see... Mm that 
all this KYC AML is uh, is a wannabe uh, kind of security. We we all say, oh, we've done our best. We've put policies in place. We've put you know uh, new systems in place, and we're surveilling and we're trying to prevent and. And then, you know, a, a normal person wants to make a bigger purchase or withdraw money from the bank account. And you have to fill in a, a huge, like almost apologetic form saying, like, why do you want to withdraw your money? But then you have actual organized crime. They just go and, and, and bribe those bank officers. So does it work? No, it's, it's not. <laughs> yeah, and it becomes this sort of uh, whack-a-mole game, right? Because the governments will try and shut down certain banks um, and then certain banks that become more permissive, let's say, <laughs> tend to be the ones that the criminals try and move all their money through. And so then it just becomes this weird sort of game of you've got kind of the good, or not good, but like the banks that are trying to be very strict with AML compliance and then the other ones that are less so, less so, who might win a lot of business because they're actually less strict about it. Mm-hmm. And then, well, uh, but the, the scary thing is that they, you have the Bitcoin companies that are doing this KYC. And, you know, it's it's a little bit worse than the usual traditional uh, fiat system because to steal, to attack a person in Bitcoin and try to steal uh, Bitcoin from them or otherwise, you know, threaten them, uh, is a uh, is much more interesting for uh, for the thieves right? than than targeting someone who has everything in a bank account and bank transactions are uh, easier to to roll back than than Bitcoin transactions. So so when I see uh, crypto companies offering free services, brackets okay, free services. And doing KYC AML, I always go like my alarm goes off, and um, I would love all the Bitcoin and crypto companies to just adopt a different style and and really and there's a, we 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 coined a, a, a slogan for this saying don't collect what you can't protect. Right, doesn't make sense if you can do verification of the customer using something else than his ID, then do that. We we put a lot of thought at, at Casa because you know we're providing this multi sig service where a Casa holds one of the keys that is never used to co-sign actively uh, the transactions, but it is used. It can be used in case you lose more of the keys than you should, right? Uh, and we've been really thinking a lot, a lot, a lot about how to do right. a recovery without invasive KYC. We don't ever want to store your names. We don't want to know where you live. Uh, after placing an order in our shop uh, and, and dispatching the order, the order and everything gets deleted. We don't store data. Uh, we don't store cookies on our website. So we, we do a lot of things that um, try, uh, that, that aim at, at putting Casa into a place where it can't be. Right. And I, look, I absolutely, absolutely appreciate that. I think that's a good focus to have as a company to try to not take data from the customer that you don't absolutely need. Uh, But let me just slight hesitation. Obviously, I'm not defending the government. I'm not defending AML and all that, right? Um, But I just, I I wonder how feasible is that? Because ultimately, if people don't have ways to buy Bitcoin, and typically any there are very few no KYC options, right? Unless you're talking like HODL, HODL or BISC or maybe like fast Bitcoins and Azteco, those kinds of Mm -hmm. options. And even those, if you go above a certain threshold, the government will probably come down on those companies too. And so then it becomes like every, the only way to actually get Bitcoins will be, well, theoretically, it could be, it it could work out that way that it's the only way to get them in any sort of serious volume is through a KYC Mm. exchange or broker or so on. And it's kind of, is that fair? Uh, It's sort of controversial, but it's like, is it fair to say, oh, no Bitcoin company should do that when it's kind of difficult for any other way right now for people to buy a lot of Bitcoin, for example? I know, it's it's difficult and uh, it requires a lot of thinking and new ways of thinking. Uh, Well, what you can definitely... uh, try to build up is how people can earn Bitcoin and earn sats, right? Because that's, in my opinion, like you can mine Bitcoins, you can buy them and you can earn them. 
And this earning part has been neglected uh, a lot or neglected has been very uh, underdeveloped, in my opinion. Uh, you know, everyone's talking about merchant adoption, but they forget that, well, merchants can set up uh, accepting Bitcoin, but if their customers don't have Bitcoin, well, they will not spend it. And if customers are buying Bitcoin in order to invest, they are much more likely to hold on to those Bitcoins. So the merchant adoption will not happen. The way it can happen is when people have a constant flow in of sats, right? When you when you're earning coins and you know it's a it's a constant flow, then uh, it's a it's a tool that you can also be spending, right? So it, the, 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 there there needs to be like a shift in uh, the the frequency of uh, of your Bitcoin earnings or otherwise it's investment and you want to hold on to it until it pays off. Yeah, right? I, th- I just, I guess for me, like obviously I'm all for that, right? Like and I'm sure Sergey Kotliar is cheering right now and he's all about earning sats and so on. And, you know, absolutely, I'm all for that. I just, I guess to me, it's how feasible is it right now? I, I suppose it'll take time for people to kind of get to that level where they can actually earn in sats because it just... It, not everyone has the sort of job that can enable that, right? Like not everyone has that sort of job. They might work for a normal fiat employer, earn fiat, and Mm -hmm. how else are you going to buy it? I I guess you could just constantly do little small cash deals and buy, but it just, I guess if you want volume, there's this kind of right now Mm -hmm. at least, and maybe part of the answer is to build the volume on some of these other alternatives. Hmm. Well, I'm hoping for some better systems that allow you to just uh, tell to your employee, hey, I want, you know, 50-50, for example, or I want 20% right. of my of my income to to be in Bitcoin and the rest in whatever mm. fiat uh, you think you uh, you think you need. Um, th- there have been several services I've been using and I've been trying myself. I still think the user experience is quite bad. And has a has a lot of, but that's positive because there's a lot of space to improve. <laughs> um, uh, some yeah, middleware, yeah. you know, could be developed uh, that just makes it super easy for the companies to process that. So instead of sending your usual transaction to your bank account, they would send it to this service account, right? And that service uh, would distribute the money. It is centralized. It is, you are known who you are, but that just happens in a typical employee-employer relationship. Um, right. So, so at least you're minimizing the number of people who have KYC'd you, right? Because if your employer already has to KYC you, well, well then there's not much you exactly. can do about that, right? Well, your employer knows who you are <laughs> or should know. Or yeah. I, I know very little uh, companies that have... Uh, <laughs> Of anonymous employees, <laughs> I know of I know of one, um, um, we, which is basically my my friend's business, and he uh, they are doing um, uh, white hat hacking, penetration testing, and a lot of his employees are just pseudonymous uh, em- hackers, right? That right. he employs are somewhere in living in the cyberspace, <laughs> and and so basically that that business is completely running on uh, on crypto. Well, I mean, that's fantastic. Obviously, that's the that's kind of the future, the promised land. That's the future that many of us Bitcoiners want people to be able to, you know, to be able to live in. But uh, I suppose it's it's about what's the best way to get there. And part of it, I think, part of this discussion is also how can companies change or change their practices such that that they are a little more friendly to this idea of maintaining your privacy. And I think you're you're getting to that as well with this idea of the privacy policy that is, you know, not like thousands of pages of legal gobbledygook, right? It's easy enough for somebody to read, but it also is minimal in the amount of data that is being collected. Yep. Well, the easiest thing is well, if you're trying to put up a, a new project in a space, just go to GitHub and fork our uh, fork our data protection and, and privacy policy. We made it uh, open source for anyone to reuse and adapt as they wish. Um, trying to show at least some some path uh, forward and make it easier. Uh, just start there. Start evaluating. Do you, I really want to use cookies on our websites to to track uh, customers and to serve them advertisement elsewhere? Um, can I achieve my goals in a different way? Um, 
And, you know, at Casa, for example, we have uh, several plans uh, that, that our customers can subscribe to. One is completely free because we want everyone to, to start using multisig and get used to the technology and, you know, feel how it is to have a good multisig, for example. Uh, but then there are paid uh, subscriptions, uh, yearly subscriptions that, you know, uh, also say, we are a company that sells you a very high quality content, uh, tools, hardware, and services. And this is what we charge you. And you know exactly what you're getting and you know exactly uh, what we are not taking from you, right? Which is the power over your, your keys and your data. We will never sell your information to any third party. Uh, we will never track you down. We will never serve you ads. And there's a trade-off, of course, because if we could have, you know, uh, AdWords and Facebook ads set up, we would probably have a, a wider reach uh, and maybe make more money. But we consciously decided to not go that way. Excellent. Well, I definitely appreciate the approach that Casa are taking. I think there's a lot that you guys are doing that is a good example for many uh, many people in the industry. And I think um, you're also kind of writing some good material. Like I saw a good article by Carolyn mm -hmm. from Casa as well about uh, some basic security tips. So look, let's talk a little bit about security tips for Bitcoiners, right? From a customer point of view, what should, be, should they be thinking about in terms of, you know, protecting their email, 2FA, mm -hmm. VPNs? Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to yeah. just comment? Yeah, so there? there's that uh, blog post by Caroline. It's called Seven Ways to Level Up Your Bitcoin OPSEC, Operational Security. And there's another one by Nick Newman. He wrote, uh, What to Do If You Become a Victim of a Data Breach. You can find both on blog.kiss.casa. Um, and, and so uh, th th those two articles are just really simple uh, overview of what not and what to do. We also developed a small application uh, that's uh, that's at app app.keys.casa, and it's a security security health check where you can just click through a few simple questions, answering yes and no, and then you you get a report on what is wrong with your operational security as a Bitcoiner. And so what can go wrong? Well, you can reuse passwords and that is a very typical mm. mistake. Uh, you generate the passwords with your own brain. That's not advised, okay? Uh, because we used to, we, we are used to thinking patterns, right? So even if people think, oh, I have a unique password for uh, each of my services. And for example, I would say for Facebook, I have uh, Facebook and my birth date. And for uh, my Gmail, I have, well, Gmail and my birth date. And that's unique, right? That's different, but there's a pattern. So if you if your uh, email has been breached in one of huge, you know, hacks, data hacks, then uh, there can be some simple algorithms for for these hackers to just go and try the pattern that you use, try to recreate the patterns for other services. Uh, so use use unique passwords that can be ideally just generated by a password manager. Now, password managers are a great tool because you get unique uh, passwords and you can store them safely but they are all protected by a master password. And that's a single point of failure. Okay, in, in any behavior for a Bitcoiner, uh, it's very important to think of single point of failures. Um, how, to, how to go about it? So master password is one password that you use to unlock the entire database. Providing someone knows that you're a Bitcoiner, someone stole the Coinbase list of users, right? He can target you, right? He knows where you live. He, he could potentially target your computer or he could just, you know, disseminate uh, uh, some keyloggers uh, uh, over some over some IPs and, and try to, to get in. They can uh, basically keylog anything that you type in. So that's a master password that will give them access to all of your passwords. There are some, some cute things such as, well, you can use an additional uh validation a, a second factor authentication uh, i will get back to that or you can use cryptography instead of that uh there's a treasure password manager which is not widely used uh not 
not so much that uh, what I would love to. Uh, but the Trezor Password Manager is a great showcase of how you can go about uh, encrypting uh, data basically and uh, getting rid of this single point of failure and that's the master password because basically instead of writing it typing it down you just connect your uh, hardware wallet and click a button uh, and you decrypt uh, whatever you want to decrypt right right is that similar to like the YubiKey key that some google employees use and that kind of thing uh well you can I think it's like a physical plugin and they have to they have to have that before oh, they yes. can log Oh yes, oh this is specific for Trezor owners. Right. Yeah. Trezor yeah. Trezor uh, the hardware wallet developed uh, uh, actually it was still while I was the CEO so we we can say we developed a a password manager that, that is showcasing that it can be done more securely, right. right? Encrypting each line of of data with a with a unique key and so on. But this requires people to be security aware and already think, oh, okay, I can actually use a hardware dongle, a hardware thing uh, to secure my data. So the typical thing for people to use would be something like a YubiKey or to have a second factor authentication via SMS. Now, that is not uh, recommended, especially if you live in the US. Uh, for, for me, uh, for many countries, to, to port your phone number from a one to another SIM card is usually um, uh, like you have to come to a place with two or three IDs and with the face on those IDs and, you know, go through a certain procedure. But because USA is such a huge market and people move all, all around, uh, they they allow to port uh, the, the phone number. So please do not, if especially if you're in the US, do not use uh, SMS as a second factor. Instead, use some YubiKey or uh, use uh, a Trezor, for example. I think that should be compatible with LastPass. And that just goes not just for password managers, but but for your emails, for any of your uh, accounts, of course, that, that you're using. What else? Well, Stay away from exchanges as a storage. <laughs> okay, do not use <laughs> do not use exchanges. Do not use uh, custodian services in general to store your crypto. For that, you have uh, much better much better options. Um, also, of course, sharing your home address uh, is something that you should consider not to do. And that comes back again to the KYC that all these. Uh, companies are trying to do right so once you give them a proof of address i don't even know why they're uh, requiring that to be honest like for for providing most of the services you don't need to know where the person lives right um yeah and the last one maybe if you're not uh using casa seedless multisig then definitely make sure that you have a good backup of your keys Right. Jameson Lop has written, uh, uh, has done a lot of research on this and has written uh, some good posts and, and recorded some videos on how to do that. Uh, yeah, but the best really is just go seedless, <laughs> go multi-seek, try it out. It's for free. It's there. Um, Excellent. Yeah. Um, I was curious then as well, when you're taking, say you're taking deliveries and you tr- want to try to not disclose your home address, examples might be i don't know if you can take it to some kind of po box or it maybe to your work address might be a bit safer than taking it to your home address at least um that's mm-hmm. a bit tricky one that's a tricky one though it's a tricky one but it's doable i myself do it this way i have a different delivery uh address from where i actually am uh i think many people can achieve that they can either have the their stuff delivered to the office or some po boxes or some something else that depends it's doable. Yeah, I guess a, a part of it is uh, just finding the motivation as well to go and take certain steps. And sometimes it's a matter of, uh, well, like Matt O'Dell says, you know, you're like that, that kid who touches the stove and now you've been burnt and now you know not mm-hmm. to do that. And so, is in your view, is that what it's going to take for people to start taking these things seriously? Well, I hope not, <laughs> but I guess it will. <laughs> so, uh, a lot of people have this thinking, it, it can't happen to me. Right. And I spent 10 years of my professional life before crypto in uh, risk management and insurance. Right. And guess what? People hate insurance. People don't want to. And they, it's not a thing that they automatically desire. 
Uh, it is a thing that they desire to have when things go wrong <laughs> and only after things went wrong. Um, so I hope people will start to like learn from pe other people's uh, stories. And it's important that people, you know, once they figured out what happened and once they secured their funds, but they had some breach that they go and report about it. They tell the story. You know, there's, I know certain people in the, in the business that have been attacked on numerous ways. Um, uh, they had a, fr a friend of mine, uh, he had a treasure wallet. Uh, someone started to, to well, they ported his uh, phone number and they started to attack all his online accounts and empty his online wallets here and there. And he said, well, but, you know, I was, I was looking at what's happening and I saw the money disappearing, but I was sitting there relatively fine because I knew that, most of my money is at home on my on my hardware wallet. A few months later, the same person messages me, totally panicking, uh, realizing that someone broke into his house. Okay, and was looking for the hardware wallet, and was probably looking for the seed, right? And now you come to a point where okay, we are talking about this self-sovereignty or sovereignty and being on your own and protecting your keys. But how is that doable for an individual that, you know, has his life and has his other worries to, to deal with? And this is like, okay, it's important, but to be realistic, how yeah. much time and effort does an average person dedicate to this, right? And so you would be either completely on your own as a Bitcoiner or you have the chance to give up the keys to a Bitcoin bank or some, you know, custodial vault, and then also run the huge systemic risk uh, with them, right? And for a long time, there was nothing in between. People wouldn't know how to protect the recovery seed, which is, by the way, the number one problem that CASA is uh, solving, okay? Uh, and there was no company or no nobody really that you could, know that, okay, I will protect my keys, I will keep full control, but I have someone that I can call when I'm in trouble. And, and so we're bridging that with CASA, uh, trying to, you know, uh, hold your yeah. hand when you want it, but never hold your keys. That's the that's the mantra. <laughs> One other thing I was keen to just ask you about is uh, you guys recently won a UX award. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes, that was a huge surprise, by the way. So Jeremy uh, got invited to this uh, co co COGX, I think well, is the name of the, it's some um, uh, AI machine learning, virtual real reality and whatnot conference. I personally didn't know, know about it before. But all of a sudden he, he sends this video saying, hey, like, yeah, we're here. We didn't win anything. And then all of a sudden, all the crowd's cheering. And it was a huge surprise for the for the team and a huge validation, you know, when you work like crazy on something and then all of a sudden there, there's an award. Uh, the award is great, uh, but um, not that important, I would say. It's amazing. It's, it's good, you know, to get uh, this appreciation. Uh, but uh, what... what, what what we're looking into is to really create some user experience that 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 puts you at ease and to create a user experience that would even breach certain security pitfalls that would, you know, protect you from yourself, <laughs> basically. And uh, we are right. lucky. Yeah. Uh, we have some really, really good designers at Casa. We, the, 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 the head of... UX is uh, Scott Herf, who also wrote a book on uh, designing products people love. Um, he used to be the head designer at Tinder, uh, you know, doing this swipe left and right. And he invented to super like, uh, which, by the way, should Tinder to profits. Um, but this person knew nothing about Bitcoin when we hired him. 
Okay. And that's amazing. That's exactly the type of designer you want because he can see and cut through all the, all the nerdiness that we are just like, you know, this is our normality. <laughs> uh, he can cut through it and, and say, no, this will not work. And if we want to create yeah. Bitcoin accessible to actual masses, then we need to have this way of thinking. So we're lucky. Fantastic. Yeah, look, I think that's um, really interesting to, to get some of that outsider perspective in some sense and um, make it easy for newbies. All right. So, look, I think that's just about all we've got time for. So just before we let you go, Elena, I'll tell, uh, tell everyone where they can find you and keep up with what you're doing and also where they can find Casa. Sure. Uh, well, I'm best visible on Twitter, uh, Twitter uh, slash or yeah, Elena Satoshi. Uh, you can follow Casa at Casa Hodl. Uh, or go to our website, keys.casa, and we have our uh, beautiful blog where we're trying to post not just like products, product updates, uh, but also uh, crypto one-on-ones, crypto two-on-ones, uh, uh, a lot of educational um, blogs uh, just to help people navigate the cyberspace. Fantastic. Well, look, I think that's been, it's been great. Really enjoyed uh, chatting with you, Elena. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you. It was a pleasure, Stefan. What do you guys think? I think as Bitcoiners, we've got to take steps to protect our digital privacy and security. So hopefully that episode was interesting for you. Uh, you can find the show notes on my website, stefanlevera.com, and there's also a subscribe link there so you can subscribe to the show. Any feedback, you can come and find me on Twitter. My handle is at Stefan Levera. My DMs are open, or you can email me, stefanlevera at pm.me. That's it from me, guys. Thanks, and I'll speak to you soon.